Hi. Good morning and welcome to the Infrastructure, Jobs and Development Gubernatorial Candidates Forum. I'm Lori Sturdivant with the Star Tribune and I'm pleased to try to keep things moving this morning. What a good group. Thank you to our hosts for bringing us together for an important topic. The list of sponsors of this event is a long one and I suspect that so, some of you have that information in hand. Let me just highlight the role of the Minnesota Transportation Alliance and the Associated General Contractors of Minnesota for bringing this together. Thanks to Tim Werke and Margaret Donahue for helping to put this on this morning. Uh, candidates, I don't know that we need to do much by way of introductions. These candidates have become extremely well known in the last few months, but uh, let me be sure that you have the players straight. On my very far left is the Independence Party candidates, Tom, candidate Tom Horner, uh, former public relations executive, uh, then State Representative, former Delano City Council member Tom Emmer, the Republican candidate in the middle, and former U.S. Senator and uh, former State Auditor Mark Dayton, the DFL candidate, next up there. Friends, not many issues con that will confront the next governor rise to a level of importance that they weren't their own 90-minute candidates for them during this busy campaign year. We are here this morning, some 300 of us by the looks of things, because we believe that investment in public infrastructure warrants that kind of attention. Transportation systems matter greatly to this state. So do other elements of our shared physical infrastructure, our sewers, our air and water ports, our public buildings, our energy grid, and increasingly our broadband connections. Such things have mattered to Minnesotans from the first. One of the very first actions of the 1858 legislature was to put on the ballot a constitutional amendment authorizing the issuance of state bonds to enable the state to loan money to private companies to build railroads. Now that happened to coincide with the panic of 1857 and those railroad companies failed to live up to their commitments. Ooh. And that became the first major controversy that a young state government had to face because from the first, Minnesotans saw a government role in working together with the private sector in establishing the infrastructure that would be the foundation of a strong economy and a strong state. Again and again, Minnesotans have affirmed that role, most recently with the 2008 dedication of another stream of tax revenue to, tax, to transportation funding. And I know some of the organizations in this room worked very hard to see that happen. Through the years, Minnesotans have supported this kind of government activity for a variety of reasons. Some have wanted better access to markets for the things that they grow and they make. Some have wanted more and better choices about where to work, live, and play. Some have favored the construction-related jobs that are created in the short term when public infrastructure is built. Some have maintained that a solid and efficient infrastructure is essential to long-term job growth in the private sector. Some consider this a matter of state pride some would add that it's a matter of the state's survival. Candidates, this morning we'd like to hear your thinking about state government's rightful role in establishing, maintaining, and improving public infrastructure. And we'd like to hear your assessment of the needs and challenges that lie ahead in this part of Minnesota's shared life. Our audience has kindly pre-submitted questions, and thank you, audience, for that from which I'll be drawing in the next 90 minutes. I can't get to all those questions. Sorry, folks, there were too many good ones, but I'll hope to mix things up and keep it lively while also trying to keep it civil and on topic. Candidates, you'll have three minutes to respond to each question, which is fairly generous, I think, and we'll offer more sparingly an extra minute to a candidate who wants to rebut something said about him or his or him or his position by an opponent. Please signal me when you need to feel the need to respond and I'll be keeping my eyes open as best I can and then I'll call on you for a brief rebuttal. I don't think the, the microphones will permit you to engage in too much spontaneous back and forth. Now at the close of today's debate we'll offer each of you again three minutes for a closing statement and I'm going to try to keep it straight so that we rotate our order as best we can. So with, by way of an opening statement let's ask let's start by asking one of those 30,000 foot questions. What's your vision? What do you see, foresee for the public infrastructure that Minnesota should have 20 years from now? How should it be different from today's? And in broad terms, how do we get from here to there? I'll start just down the line, starting with Mark Dagan. Three minutes? Yes, three minutes. Well, thank you very much for this invitation. Those of you in the obstructed view seats, I hope uh, you can also uh, see where we are here. Uh, Thank you all for 
joining with us today. I think, uh, as uh, Lori said, this is uh, such a crucial topic for the future of Minnesota. And as I came to learn and believe when I was Commissioner of Economic Development for Minnesota, twice uh, previously, there is a very important positive role for state government to play in, in partnership with all of you in the private sector to uh, fund the projects, make investments, public and privately shared uh, financial investments that both create jobs in the immediate sense as well as uh, build these projects uh, and uh, our infrastructure that are so vital. You know, if you go back to coming right out of World War II, the federal government made major investments in public infrastructure, the interstate highway system, um, much of the, the sewer and water, some of which has now become antiquated, but which formed the foundation for the private sector economic growth throughout this country, did so actually during that time uh, because of its uh, tax policies with a federal deficit of less than 3%. And as I say, created the future for the, the next 50 years. That's our challenge today is to make the public-private investments necessary in the infrastructure for the next 50 years. And having been to China seven times and all six times in the last decade and seeing the public infrastructure investments that they're making in high-speed rail and highway systems that are, uh, at least on the eastern seaboard, better than ours, have better capacity, are in better condition, having driven now over the last uh, year thousands of miles around Minnesota to see the deterioration of our trunk highway system, the congestion here in the metropolitan area, those uh, investments are, are seriously needed in this state and in this nation. Now we'll get to go into some detail of some of these areas, but let me just sketch them out briefly. I see starting next year a bonding bill in 2011, uh, a significant one depending on interest rates. The Star Tribune uh, editorialized just a couple weeks ago. Uh, just about the, the advantages of with low interest rates and, and the pent-up demand and Governor Plenty's unfortunate veto of, of about $300 million worth of projects, about 8,500 jobs that people could be working here today in Minnesota building those uh, projects. We need to uh, increase our in, in spending for highway construction, and I'll detail that if the question allows. And we also need uh, an energy savings fund uh, to retrofit state buildings, local government buildings, uh, to convert uh, heating and cooling systems to use alternative energy, both for energy savings and for the jobs that those will provide. Thank you. Representative Emmer. Three That's minutes is very generous, Lori. Thank you very much for having us here. I think uh, my colleagues up here were complaining that uh, that's two days in a row that Emmer is in the middle. He's the centrist. I'm on your right this time. I'm on, I'm on your right this time. And Senator Dayton just pointed out he's on my right this time, so. But Mark, I'd like to just emphasize for everybody out there, you are still on my left, so. Here's, a, I'm Tom Emmer. Uh, probably the, uh, well, I guess I'm better known now, but I was uh, absolutely the least known of the three that you see sitting before you. I'm a guy from Delano that uh, is married for the last 24 years, raising a family, seven kids, uh, was doing something different with my life up till about six years ago, and I went into the Minnesota House of Representatives. Never saw myself uh, here, but I am now, and I bring a different perspective, uh, something new. I, I will tell you that what you will hear from my colleagues is that we absolutely have to raise taxes. They will argue about which taxes, but we must have more revenue for government. I disagree with that. I think people need to understand that while we have a deficit, they gotta understand what the deficit really is. It is government in this state will have more money in the next biennium to spend than it does now. Uh, by some accounts over 7% more, some 2 billion plus more in revenue, and it wants to spend more than 17%. So government's getting a raise in the next biennium of over 7%, and yet it wants to spend more than 17% more, so it's a roughly $6 billion de deficit. Uh, in fact, if we just continued to do what we're doing right now and didn't spend any more, we'd have a surplus based on the projections at the end of the next biennium. Uh, that being said, 
let's talk about what we're here to talk about today. Uh, I believe that first off, we can no longer do things the way we've been doing them. We have to look at redesigning government to deliver the things people expect it to deliver in the most efficient manner. You cannot say that what we've been doing has been working because in this state, every so many years, and this isn't a Republican Democrat thing, these are good people that want to make Minnesota a better place, but it's the, the design of government is such that Government continues to grow, and every time it runs out of money, we just go back to the men and women and businesses of this state and tell them we just need more of your money. Today, we have so much government in this state, we are literally suck suffocating the private economy. So, future, when it comes to priorities, it says in our Constitution, it's not a matter of what any one of the three people in front of you thinks. The Constitution of the state of Minnesota says that the state will be responsible for a system of roads and bridges. It is a priority and you must fund your priorities. Uh, it's uh, important that we keep in mind that roads and bridges, 95% uh, of us travel by roads and bridges and move our product by roads and bridges. Uh, transit is a very important uh, piece because it's about moving people that may not otherwise uh, have m means of transport. But I will tell you that out of the three people up here, I'm pretty sure I'm the only one that takes the bus on a regular basis. Uh, so I'm very familiar with how that works. We need to continue to improve our transit in this state and frankly in more dense communities. But you gotta remember, 95% of us travel by roads and bridges and we could double our transit usage over the next 10 years and 90% of us would still travel by roads and bridges. Roads and bridges should be our priority. They should be properly funded. When you talk about uh, a vision, it's gotta be a vision that goes beyond the next election. It has to be a vision, much like I think some of the good people in our Minnesota Department of Transportation try to do which is project where we need to be in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Again, you've got to set those in place and you've got to make sure that you fund your priorities. Uh, and I look forward to having a great discussion with you today. Thank you, Representative Emmert. Mr. Horner, welcome. Well, What's your vision? <clears throat> thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks to all of you for, for hosting us. And thanks for the very impressive turnout. This is terrific and very pleased to have the opportunity to talk about uh, an issue that is so important to, to Minnesota. And I don't have to tell the folks in this room how important it is. That's why you're here. I think when you look at the track record of the, the public over the last couple of years, they get it. I mean, look what's happened in, in the last couple of years with business and taxpayers stepping up in 2006 to add more money to transportation through a constitutional amendment. Stepping up to add more money to transportation construction through a gas tax increase. Stepping up even in 2008, <coughs> excuse me, stepping up in 2008 to add money to build the infrastructure of, of our natural resource assets. Minnesotans are ready to make the investment that's not the problem. The problem is one of leadership. The problem is one of wishful thinking by some who believe that we can just keep shrinking the pie and somehow magically we'll have the resources to make the investments that will keep Minnesota competitive. That's not the case. Look at MnDOT. They've estimated that in the next 20 years to maintain the roads and bridges, to build capacity at a level that we will need, it's going to cost $65 billion by 2030. They've identified $15 billion. We have a $50 billion gap just in that piece of our infrastructure. Look at the record harvest that Minnesota farmers will have this year. And yet the, the paucity of 10 ton roads to get their product to market. The deterioration of our rail system to get their product to market. Look at the needs we need to make in energy, in retrofitting our schools and, and public buildings, in generation and transmission. Yet where are the dollars coming in a budget that says we just have to keep shrinking, we just have to keep pulling back? We ought to be making investments in broadband. It is the REA of our generation. It is the way we're going to assure that communities around the state have access to world-class education, world-class health care, world-class economic development opportunities. We are not going to get there if we have politicians who continue to pretend we can do a lot with nothing. But we're also not going to get there if we have leadership that just says tax everything only to grow government. We need leadership that says here's a strategic plan. 
And frankly, I'm the only one that has been willing to put out the plan in a comprehensive way that addresses all of these issues. A plan on how we will responsibly invest in the economy, how we'll strengthen the economy through, through tax reform, not just tax cuts or tax increases, but tax reform that is going to allow for more investment, that is going to allow for companies to grow, to, to create the kinds of jobs that stimulate the economy, that make all of your work so much more vital. Um, to, to streamline the permitting process, to make specific proposals around bonding. It's not just if we can have this interest rate or that interest rate. We need a bonding bill next year of $400 million to invest in, in roads, in bridges, in, in core economic assets. And the willingness to put other specific uh, uh, infrastructure issues on the table. I'm the only one who has said, look, we need to keep the Vikings as an asset to Minnesota. And if we're going to keep the Vikings, we need to be partners in building a new stadium. <clears throat> partners in building a stadium in a way that is responsible to the public, in a way that keeps the revenue stream outside of the general fund, we can do it. I've put out a plan. We ought to have those kinds of specifics. Because I think in 2010, more than other elections in which I've seen recently, this is a year in which Minnesotans need to understand the specifics of each of our proposals, need to understand where we're at, what we're proposing. Because if we don't build the mandate this fall, we're never going to have the accomplishments that Minnesota deserves in 2011 and beyond. Thank you. Each of you have teed up some topics that we'll return to in the next few minutes, but for just a moment, I'd like to stick with that big vision 2030 outlook, if I may. Uh, we have a, a, a change, quite a change coming, many analysts say, in the uh, source of revenue that we have relied on primarily over the years, since 1924, for financing our transportation system. The gas tax may not be as robust a generator of revenue for transportation as it has been through most of the 20th century. Considering the possibility of a, 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 what could be a precipitous decline in gas tax revenue as technology for automotive transportation changes, how do you propose to provide a, a guaranteed source of transportation funding to compensate? Or would you? Let's start with Representative Emmer and we'll go again for three minutes on the future of transportation funding. Well, uh, Lori and everybody who's here, this was the topic when we were talking about passing the gas tax. Uh, we'd just gotten done with MVEST, and then there was a discussion about the gas tax. And believe me, uh, that is over. Uh, there was an override, and it was passed, and that's fine. But the debate in the public square that uh, I think at times was not uh, adequately uh, uh, reported was, frankly, that we knew this was going to happen that we've got to look at alternative uh, methods to fund our roads and bridges, to fund our transportation infrastructure. You cannot rely upon a fuel source that hopefully, as we look for alternative uh, sources of energy and, and methods of transportation, is not the only thing we rely on in the future. I believe that this is one of the things that bonding absolutely should be used for. Bonding, it, it, if it is a number one priority of the state to provide a system of roads and bridges, then bonding is one of the tools and frankly should be the most important tool when we set uh, that in place. That's what I think the future holds and then uh, it, it, we're gonna have discussions about uh, other ideas as well. I, I, do, uh, I, I do listen though when I hear it's all about tax reform. Because you want to build roads and bridges, you want to uh, improve transit, you want to improve rail, we've got, to, somebody has got to start to sound the bell that it is not just about more taxes. It's not just about tax reform. It's not about government constantly gasping and grasping for the new revenue stream. We've got to start looking at redesigning the machine itself. You have got to create an environment that generates jobs. That's what we're missing here. This discussion seems to be all one-sided, which is how do we find revenue sources and sustain old and perhaps soon to be outdated revenue sources to support the services that we need. Well, you can't support anything if you are not growing new jobs in the private sector in the state of Minnesota. So it's a balance. There's no question that bonding is going to be part of the picture if we're in the office in the future, but you've also got to have an environment that starts to grow jobs in the state of Minnesota, starts to create the revenues that will support the services, and I've already said, roads and bridges, transit, very important to the future of this state. Thank you. Thank you, Representative 
representative. I was about to promote you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mr. Horner. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, let me just say to my friend, Representative Emmert, that if the debate seems one-sided, it is only because there is only one candidate who has put out anything specific to have a discussion over. That's the difference. I mean, we need to put specifics on the table. The gas tax discussion wasn't a debate around alternative uh, kinds of, of revenue sources. That never occurred. The gas tax debate, at least on the Republican side of the aisle, was no new taxes. That was the only debate that occurred. We need to have that discussion about how we fund, how we invest, how we make changes. Look, there was a McKinsey report that came out not too long ago that said the United States is facing the equivalent of a permanent national recession because of the education gap. Education is an infrastructure issue. That's going to create the jobs that place the demand on, on infrastructure and that create the ability to pay for the infrastructure. We've got to be realistic about this. So let's look at that $65 billion in 2030. And I agree, we do need a new way of thinking about it. There's $15 billion that MnDOT has identified out of that $65 billion. Let's take that and have a discussion that starts with outcomes. What are the critical assets in Minnesota that we need to fund with that $15 billion that's available? What drives the economy of Minnesota? And maybe it's Highway 14. Maybe it's an urban highway. Maybe it's a transit system. Maybe it's something else. But let's take that $15 billion and have that discussion. Then we can decide on the next tier of priorities and say, how else do we fund that? Is it a user fee? Is it a toll road? Is it some of the creative things that already are happening in Minnesota? Or is it an increased tax? Or is it bonding? But let's have it around priorities, not take six or $15 billion that we have, divide it by 201, the number of legislative districts, and say everybody gets a little bit and the state gets not much of anything. We need to be thoughtful about it. We need to have a bonding bill. We need to have tax reform. We need to make an investment in a strong economy that's not just building out roads. It is also building out education. It is building out health care. It is doing all of those things that make Minnesota a strong state. Okay, the question is about the funding source for the future. Senator Dayton. Well, I'm, I'm going to insert just a little bit of a rebuttal here, if that's all right, <clears throat> and save us time for the questions. Uh, Mr. Horner, I, I do take exception to your saying you're the only candidate who's put forth a specific proposal. Uh, I have done so in the, both the tax and spending cut, and I'm looking for more spending. And I would just say that you know your proposal to extend the sales tax, which would to make up the revenues you're talking about, about $2.8 billion to unspecified services, is, is not a specific proposal. It goes part way, but you should specify the services that you're going to tax that are not now taxed, and also invoking the word redesign 26 times to describe uh, your spending cuts is, again, uh, not really specific as you need to be to really give people a chance to analyze what you're proposing to do and where you're going to get real savings that are not going to impact people's lives. And uh, Representative Emory, I would just have to say in terms of the revenues, you know, it's true, as you said, that the revenues are going to increase, I believe, about 7 percent for the next biennium. It's also worth pointing out that the revenues uh, declined in this biennium compared to the previous biennium. So that if you compare uh, the previous biennium, a span of four years to the, the next biennium, uh, the revenues will actually go up about 3.5%. And, and of course the tax structure, as you know, Representative Emmer, has not been changed. So the reason is because more people are working. So the equation that we want to follow in this state is we want more people working to generate more revenues uh, without changing the tax structure and uh, also putting more people to work. I would also point out that over that four-year period, we have over 22,000 more students in uh, kindergarten through 12th grade that we have to support. We have over 220,000 more people living in Minnesota during that time, so our state's population and their needs are growing as well. Uh, actually, we agree about the need for bonding, for transportation. You know, pay-as-you-go is great in an era where we could uh, do that and keep pace, but Given that we've fallen behind uh, over the last decade, and given, as uh, Mr. Horner pointed out, the need that MnDOT has outlined, uh, we need to make, uh, in the public sector, the kind of capital and investments that the private sector makes through uh, debt financing. It's great if you can build stores or build uh, uh, shopping malls, whatever, 
uh, in paying in cash, but, but in, in reality, if you're going to keep pace with the, the competition and you need to expand more rapidly, you need to issue uh, debt financing in order to do so. The problem with the federal government now, and one of the reasons I objected to the way the federal government went from the surpluses that Bill Clinton left behind to the deficits that have now occurred under two uh, presidents, one Republican, now one Democrat, is that they're, they're borrowing for current consumption uh, rather than borrowing for, for long-term capital investments. So that's what the state should do. And one of the proposal, approaches that uh, other states have used is using some of the, the increase in the federal highway funds to issue what are called Garvey bonds. They're uh, bonds that are backed by that revenue stream, the principal and the interest payments. It's allowed uh, states like Arkansas to accelerate uh, 16 years the uh, uh, projects that they're going to make. So you can complete a project like Highway 14 in one or two construction seasons rather than piecemeal. We need to greatly expand, not just for one year, but over the next decade, over the next two decades, our uh, highway uh, and public transit um, uh, improvement projects, if we're going to put the state back into the sound uh, infrastructure that it needs to be to support the economic growth in the future. Well, that tees up a question about bonding, and I'd like to hear more from each of you about that. Uh, this time we'll be starting with Mr. Horner. The question would be uh, uh, t more to describe your philosophy about the rightful use and the rightful size of, of state bonding. If you'd care to comment, and I know Representative Mr. Horner has already specified what size of bonding bill he'd like to see in 2011. I'd like to hear about the size of the bonding bill, if any, the other two candidates would like to see in 2011. But then talk more broadly, too, about how and when the state should issue bonds. Mr. Horner. Yeah. Well, th thank you, and it's a, a great question. I think bonding ought to, to be considered, especially over the next couple of years, in, in three areas. One is that we do have some commitments outstanding that, that we need to follow through on. If we're going to ask Minnesotans to trust in government, then we ought to follow through on the commitments that have been made. So um, uh, civic centers in, in Rochester and St. Cloud, good example um, of, of commitments that are out there that we ought to follow through on. Secondly, we ought to put the top priority, though, on building out the infrastructure that is needed to grow the economy um, in, in very short order. I mean, those kinds of projects, especially as we look at a 2011 bonding bill that can put people to work, the, the, the uh, bridge improvement program, highways, those kinds of systems that are ready to go, that can put people to work, and that meet a true long-term economic need for Minnesota. But then thirdly, I think we also need to look at bonding as a tool to make long-term investments in the economic assets of, of Minnesota. And I think there are very important investments that we ought to make in that in 2011, 2012, and, and beyond. And those come in, in a couple of areas. You know, we ought to make sure that Minnesota is the knowledge and innovation state. Again, if we're going to make sure that, that we have a strong, healthy, industry, supporting the infrastructure, building out the infrastructure, we need a strong, healthy economy. That leads to, to good education, to research at the University of Minnesota. And so we ought to be making bonding investments in, in uh, facilities like the Science and Engineering Building at St. Cloud State. Those kinds of programs that are going to create the jobs for the future. Good, well-paying career jobs that can support the kind of government and investments that we want. We ought to be making an investment in broadband. And I know Representative Emmer disagrees with me. But again, I think that's going to be the economic asset of of, of the future. I would hope that in most areas it can be done as a private investment. In some areas it's going to be a private public partnership and in some areas it is going to be a public investment. And let's deal with it and move on. And then we also need to make investments in, in energy, in those kinds of, of assets that are going to fuel, fuel the economy of the future. So in generation, transmission, in new technologies, those kinds of, of areas that are going to be important to our economic future. Thank you. Let's go to Senator Dayton about your philosophy about bonding and the size of bonding bill you'd like to see next year. Well, I, I think uh, Mr. Horner's bill is, is too modest, to $400 million, and uh, I'll be interested to represent member since he's voted against all six bonding bills uh, when he was in the legislature. Uh, my proposal would be in the neighborhood of a billion dollars. I'd want to look at the interest rates at that point in time. Uh, I want to be prudent, but I also want to be proactive. You know, Minnesota ranks, according to the Minnesota Taxpayers Association, 34th among the states in our uh, in interest debt. It's about 3% of our uh, state uh, projected expenditures for the next biennium. Uh, I don't think we want to go 
uh, much higher than that. On the other hand, uh, by one econometric study, a, a professor at George Mason University, every billion dollars of public investment in non-residential uh, construction creates about 28,500 jobs. So by uh, Governor Plenty's vetoing $300 million uh, in the last bonding bill, he left about, by that measure, 8,500 jobs of workers in Minnesota who are unemployed today who could be working on those projects. So there's both the short-term benefit of a, a billion dollar bonding bill in, in a state that has a gross uh, state product of $263 billion. I mean, that's not uh, going to tip the scales uh, in terms of, of the economic uh, recovery, but it's going to make a significant contribution. 28,500 jobs through a billion dollars of public investment is a good deal for the people of Minnesota, especially when we're at a point where we can afford to do so and where the interest rates support that. And that bonding bill should occur, uh, by the way, next year, 2011, not waiting until 2012. Uh, and we talked about the transportation bonding, and, and that's another important component. The uh, issuing of bonds uh, for highway construction projects, again, is an important job creator, and it's essential if we're going to uh, put Minnesota uh, back on a uh, track to economic growth. When you can't get your goods to market, when you can't get your employees to and from work, uh, people have a choice of where they're going to locate or expand a business are going to are going to choose places where they can where there is good infrastructure where they can get their products conveniently to markets around the country where they can get uh, their employees to and from work where they can get themselves to and from work so we shortchange the future of minnesota drastically by under investing in our, our highway and public transit to pr projects and I would just say, uh, you know, finally, that we also need to look at the, uh, uh, you know, sewer and water systems of the state. That's another critical need, you know. And again, it is, it, they're expensive. But they're only going to become more expensive in the future. We have to uh, work with the federal government to, and with local governments to figure out how these projects, which are increasingly unaffordable for local governments, are going to be uh, financed. Again, looking ahead to the next 50 years. This, this election is about the future of Minnesota for us, and it's about the future of Minnesota for our children and our grandchildren. And that's the perspective I would bring to that uh, decision. Thank you. Tom Horner wants a one-minute rebuttal, but Tom, I'd like to ask you to hold that thought so we hear from all three candidates first, and then I'll come back to you for that rebuttal moment. Tom Emmer. The, uh, first off, you're right. I have voted against uh, every bonding bill that's been presented while I've been a state legislator. Uh, I think bonding bills are, and you've heard what I believe the priorities should be. Uh, this uh, is what a bonding bill should be used for. It should be used for public infrastructure of statewide significance. Roads and bridges are at the top of that list. There are flood walls. There are other issues, public safety infrastructure. These are the things that bonding bills should be used for, and they should not be used to uh, pass policies like uh, policy on greenhouse gas emissions that would not otherwise get through the, uh, the legislative process. They should not be used to give out a Christmas tree full of gifts to uh, convince career politicians to give their votes in other areas where they might not otherwise provide them. Bonding bills should be used for what they are intended. They should be used for long-term capital investments that actually do add to your economic growth in the state of Minnesota. And this is where we differ in a major way. The only specifics, the only specifics that my colleagues have offered is that they're going to raise taxes. The only specifics that they are, have offered, they may differ on where those come from, is that government simply doesn't have enough revenue. We are not willing to look at exactly how we're going to redesign uh, the actual machine of government so it delivers these services. And you don't do it with a bonding bill where you put your state's bonding rating at risk. We just had this in the last, we talk about bonding bills. Senator Dayton, what you forget is when you take a billion dollars out of the private economy to pay for this, uh, these many things that aren't necessary, uh, I will tell you that uh, uh, in the last bonding bill, it was about 300 million. Somewhere around 300 to 400 million absolutely applied to public infrastructure, whether it be roads and bridges, uh, public safety infrastructure, those types of things that we absolutely needed to do. Uh, you got to remember that when you take that billion dollars out of the private economy, you've just taken more money out of the entrepreneurs, out of the job creators' pockets. Yes, there is a benefit because you hope to be building uh, bridges and roads that will transport product to market. 
That's absolutely true. But when it goes beyond that, when you are not building uh, things, uh, for instance, when I get uh, in a bonding bill, it says we're going to give uh, uh, X number of hundreds of thousands of dollars to a couple of buildings in Roseville to put grass roofs on them. That's not a, an item of statewide significance, and it should not be in a bonding bill, I respectfully submit. And when you uh, do this without regard to what's happening in your private economy, without any responsibility for the balance that you need to, to have, you'd have to build the infrastructure while you grow your private economy, because that in turn will grow the revenues that will allow you to do even more with your public infrastructure. Got some rebuttal requests. Tom Horner, you're up first. Yes, just uh, two quick points. One, um, a Representative Emmer, I think, intentionally keeps misrepresenting the specifics, and, and that's fine because that's what happens when you're willing to put specifics on the table. I'm not just proposing tax increases, and I think Representative Emmer knows that. My proposal is comprehensive tax reform. You need to raise revenue to pay for the tax cuts that are important to make for businesses, to give businesses resources for investment, for, for uh, retention of income, so that they can grow, they can expand, they can create new jobs. It is a tax proposal, the key elements of which have been endorsed by the, the uh, business-led commission appointed by uh, Governor Pawlenty, by Growth and Justice, by others at all points on the political spectrum. But what I really want to address is Senator Dayton's continuing claim that I don't have enough specifics. And so, fair enough, Senator, but now in the last couple of debates, I've heard you say that you want to go to a single-payer health care system, that you think we ought to restore over and above what we're already doing on per-pupil aid, $1,300 per person, that, that you want to restore the $1.8 billion transfer to schools. Now you want to pay the debt service on a billion-dollar bonding bill. I think, Senator, you owe it to many of the people in this audience who I would guess are sub-S corporations, LLCs, people who are going to pay your individual income tax. Be specific, Senator. Tell them what is the rate that you're going to ask them to pay. What's the rate, Senator? Be specific. Just, just so happens that Mark Dayton has also asked for a rebuttal. Mark Dayton. Well, I'll keep the, uh, the top uh, personal income tax rate below the, the highest in the nation, which is now 11%. Uh, I, I'm tempted to say, Mr. Horner, facetiously, that uh, my answer to uh, any of your questions now will be that I will redesign, uh, because I, I have, I think, now still 25 more redesigns to invoke before I'm at your level. But I also want, I want to say, actually, in both of our defense, that I'm amazed, uh, Representative Emmer, that you could uh, question both of us about specifics when you are the one candidate who absolutely refuses every day to provide specifics about how and where you're going to eliminate a projected $5.8 billion deficit in the next biennium. You give us a couple anecdotes that add up to you know, a million or a couple hundred million, but we're all waiting, and I think the people of Minnesota deserve very soon your specific proposal for where you're going to cut $5.8 billion in spending and what the impacts are going to be on real people's lives. Since you haven't had a rebuttal, Representative Ember, would you like one? Absolutely. I, you know, I appreciate Senator Dayton that uh, perhaps uh, it's it, it's incomprehensible to people who have uh, done business as usual for th three decades to believe that if government doesn't isn't allowed to grow at the rate it wants to, that somehow is a cut. I mean, government has, it's spending roughly 30 to 31 billion right now out of our general fund. It's going to have 32 uh, plus billion to spend in the next biennium. Uh, yes, there will be difficult choices to make. I think everybody in this room understands it. And if you travel around Minnesota, if you've actually uh, uh, struggled to meet a payroll and run a small business, and you understand what families are feeling around this state, they're asking for the type of leadership that doesn't tell them what they want to hear. You know, it's not the same old politician thing that we're going to raise this and we're going to grow this and government can make choices for you uh, that you can't make by yourself. They want people that are going to tell them this is how we get out of this. This is all of us together. Just tell us what we need to do. It's holding the line on spending that is out of control in Washington, out of control in Minnesota. It's getting government to start making the, the choices that it needs to make to deliver those services that are absolutely necessary and get jobs back in this state. Okay, candidates, now we'd like to ask you to bore in on the issue of metro area transit, though 
there are transit issues outstate and feel free to comment on those as well. Particularly interested in the future of light rail transit in the, in, uh, the metro area, uh, other modes of transit that might be on your wish list, and we'd like you to comment on how transit is governed with the future of the Metropolitan Council being a point of discussion at least in one party's gubernatorial race. We are uh, going to, let's talk transit for the next nine minutes and let's begin with Senator Dayton. Well, we are obviously behind uh, most other metropolitan areas in our uh, public transit systems. Would that uh, we had had the uh, political will, the, the public recognition to back when, I think it was 1970, 71, when the Metropolitan Council first proposed uh, the equivalent of a light rail system, would that we had taken advantage of, uh, at that point, of about, I believe, 80 percent of federal funding for those projects, and so then it dropped to 50 percent, and now it's, you know, come be reduced to a, a, a piecemeal uh, kind of uh, funding that's going to be increasingly more expensive, but, you know, it, it is certainly one component, and extending the uh, North Star Line up to St. Cloud, where the, the major population center that would utilize that train is one strategy, the rail that goes to from southeastern metro, then extending the, uh, the, the network of lines with the uh, central corridor as the next one, and then eventually connecting that up to the airport and probably bringing something in from the southwest. I mean, these are projects are going to take, as I say, uh, significantly longer because of the uh, population density and, and the, or the, the routing uh, issues that are involved, as well as the cost of paying for them. But uh, we, we committed to that, and I think that's uh, obviously something we're going to need to figure out. How can we prudently spend the, the, the money necessary and work with the federal government to afford to do so? Uh, buses are still, you know, the, the most uh, flexible form of public transit. We need to incentivize uh, people using uh, buses. We need to provide park and ride lots that are sufficient uh, in capacity to give people more encouragement to do so. We need to continue to build highways as uh, MnDOT is starting to do now, where you provide uh, an advantage to bus travel to shorten the, the commute times and, and again, uh, provide a, a, a reward in terms of less time for people using them. And you know, buses have the flexibility as population shifts, which it will over the next 20, 30 years, that buses can adapt to that, whereas a fixed rail system is, is much more, is much obviously uh, completely inflexible. But it's, it's not either or, it's both. And we'll, we need to continue to make those investments. The, the management of it, I'm certainly willing to look for a way to make it more efficient. You know, some of the suburban areas have decided to, you know, they're better off operating their own transit systems. And uh, I would certainly, you know, respect those uh, decisions. On the other hand, I think they've got to be integrated with a larger metropolitan uh, system. And we need to look and see if that's the most uh, cost efficient way to do it, to have uh, those separate entities uh, inter interlocking, or whether we need a, a broader metropolitan approach. Senator Emmer, what would be the future of light rail under a Governor Emmer administration? Well, I don't think it's so much uh, whether it's light rail or buses. I think it's about mobility, moving people. Uh, the question is not what type of transit, but what is it that you're trying to accomplish. And I think the, uh, the question that has to be asked is, where do you get the highest return for your dollar? I, you know, I, I've never been a fan of, uh, of light rail, but that doesn't mean that's not part of the answer. I, I do have to acknowledge that the Hiawatha rail uh, has provided some benefits to those neighborhoods in terms of the values of their homes and its moving people. But the North Star rail so far uh, is not giving the same type of return that we had expected. Uh, the subsidy is not um, actually, uh, we're spending somewhere, last time I looked, close to $20 a rider, uh, you and I are, uh, to fund that. Uh, it, it makes more sense, and I would ask my colleagues if they've ever ridden the bus. I, I mean, uh, Senator Dayton talks about we got to make them more efficient. I'll tell you what. You ought to ride one. These guys do a great job. Uh, yes, there are some lines. There is some more flexibility that needs to occur. I don't think it should be part of Met Council. I think there should be uh, put it in a department within uh, the Minnesota Department of Transportation or some other area. But Met Council itself uh, is something that we no longer uh, need in its current form. But when it comes to buses, I've ridden them. I ride from Wyzetta to St. Paul on a regular basis, and it's amazing. You know, you want to drive from Delano to the Capitol uh, during rush hour, and it's going to take you sometimes an hour and a half to get there, depending on what the weather's like. Uh, you drive in non-rush hour periods, you can get there in about 40 minutes, uh, in, uh, especially with a new uh, link that's been opened up from, uh, from Wyzetta out to Maple Plain. But you take the bus and you pick it up at the park and ride in Wyzetta, and you can get, with one uh, uh, change in downtown Minneapolis, you can actually get to the Capitol within about 50 minutes. 
I, I think it is a good system. It's one, again, the issue is mobility of, of people and goods. That's the goal of our transportation system. Uh, transit is an asset within that overall transportation plan, but where you put those dollars, you should be putting them to make to ensure that you're getting the highest return for the dollar when it comes to actually uh, mobility of people. And what would transit look like in a Horner administration? Well, and first let me just say that um, I hope that someplace in those 25 additional mentions of redesign, Senator, that, that you will talk to us about the rate that you want to impose on these business people because 11 percent, I think by your estimate, raises about $3 billion, if I'm correct, by your numbers. That's not nearly enough to pay for the billions and billions and billions of dollars that you're promising in new spending. And there aren't enough bonding bills in the world that are going to help small businesses if they're not in business because they're having to pay rates that are at the top of the nation. And that's the reality. So on, on transit, we need to have a comprehensive strategic plan that looks at what's the outcome. How do we move people and, and do it efficiently and do it in a way that is integrated with, the, with our highway system. So I disagree with both of these gentlemen on North Star and I know a little something about North Star. Um, when I was employed, we helped uh, work on that and, and make it happen. You know, North Star will be successful as, as the line now exists. Um, it, it is less than a year old representative. I think any new system takes time. It is just falling, just marginally short. Um, and some of it is going to come in adjustment of schedules, in different kinds of promotions. But Senator, it's not quite ready to go to St. Cloud. That's not a cost efficient um, priority. And as much as I would like to say, let's get it up to St. Cloud, that the, the, the data just don't support that kind of, of extension for the cost that it would take. I think we do need to invest in new transit systems, including light rail. But I also think we need the leadership to stand up and say, look, we need transit systems that are going to work. And one of the concerns I have on Central Corridor, and I support Central Corridor, is I fear we're building the metrodome of light rail transit. A little bit of something for everybody and doesn't work well for anybody. I mean, a 40-minute ride from downtown to downtown because we want to build out all of these stations isn't the value of transit. We need to, to be smart about it. Now, maybe we can address that through express trains and, and things like that, but we need the leadership to say, if we build it, we need to make sure that we're getting the value out of it. We ought to look at, at fixed uh, uh, exclusive bus right of ways and make sure that, that we are integrating bus with rail, with highways. It is effective. There was a terrific story in Laurie's newspaper this morning talking about the, the value of bus service, but also talking about what it takes to get some suburban riders on those buses. And we may need to upgrade the, the, the quality of buses, not just in the suburban uh, communities for, for longer commutes, but in the inner cities. It's all of these things that we need to do to invest in a thoughtful, integrated, strategic transit system. Senator Dayton would like a rebuttal minute. One minute, Senator. Well, Mr. Horner, I'd just point out that my, a small business or anybody would only be paying an, an incremental increase in their income taxes if their uh, joint filer are making more uh, an actual income of $173,000 and an individual making more than $152,000. And the Minnesota Department of Revenue has analyzed uh, my proposal at those rates, and it would not apply to 92 percent of the small business uh, owners in Minnesota. You, on the other hand, are going to make working Minnesotans, middle-income Minnesotans, and small businesses pay a higher sales taxes on clothing and on unspecified services. And since you're asking me for specificity, I would ask you to specify which of the services uh, that you're going to raise some $2.8 billion in taxes by, by taxing that are not now taxed. Those are consumer payments because you're not going to tax business payments for services. So you're going to make the, the working people, the middle-income people, the uh, lower and middle-income people, the poor people, and the upper-income people in Minnesota all pay uh, about $2.8 billion in, in higher uh, sales tax in sales taxes for services. And, and that's a regressive tax compared to the one I would propose. Candidates, let's shift gears and talk a little bit about the state's regulatory climate, something that I think each of you in previous debates have, has acknowledged is a, a, a sore spot for people in this audience and a number of business people around the state. 
please describe for us how you would alter that picture and what your analysis is of, of where the problem really lies and uh, how you would change our regulatory climate to be more business friendly without undercutting the standards of environmental protection that really are the foundation of some of those regulations. And this time let's start with Representative Emmer. Well, I think uh, after taxes and maybe even ahead of taxes in the state of Minnesota, this is the problem. Uh, and where does it come from? We have too many state agencies with overlapping authority that are not only setting their own rules, but then are charged with the responsibility and frankly are competing with one another to enforce those rules and ensure compliance. Uh, that coupled or combined with the fact that we've now given uh, our agencies the ability to frankly become their own collection <coughs> agencies has turned around, uh, I think, what uh, well-meaning people, and again, these are just Minnesotans. I don't care what, uh, what political jersey they were wearing when they did this. Uh, everybody wants to protect our great natural resources in this state. We all want clean air. We all want clean water. We all want to turn over a healthier state to our kids and our grandkids than even we grew up in. That is the ultimate goal, no matter what your political persuasion is, if you live here in Minnesota. But we've, we've got a system now, Lori, that has developed in such a way that Minnesotans who are not only uh, operating businesses, but Minnesotans who just uh, are, are using our streets, our highways, uh, trying to do things uh, in their backyard, they feel like they can walk out their front door and they're violating some rule or some law. And that some state agent is gonna show up and fine them or give them uh, some more serious consequences. I told the story yesterday and one of my colleagues said, well, that's just because we don't have enough 10 ton roads. You know what, uh, the road restrictions are very important and we do need more uh, uh, heavy duty roads, there's no question. And we need to have a plan for that. But when you start getting down to the minutia of not only the weight of the load, but the uh, weight on each individual axle, when you've got a farmer who's taken a three quarter load of grain to the elevator, and he gets pulled over and he's got to stand there. This happened last week. He's got to stand there and watch as a MnDOT representative goes through all of his permits and his licenses and then uh, takes the weight of the vehicle. Everything's fine. But he's got a three-quarter load that apparently is not evenly distributed. One axle was a few hundred pounds over the per axle restriction and he got a fine of almost $300. That's where you've gotten way out of whack with what we all want. It's time to reduce the number of agencies that are creating these rules. Frankly, they should be legislative approved after they have been uh, uh, promulgated by the agencies and then make Minnesota a one window stop for business in this state. I think that's how you ultimately solve this problem. Thank you, Mr. Horner. Well, I agree with Representative Emmer that we have to reduce the number of agencies, but I disagree with what he told the farmers at FarmFest that we ought to put all regulations affecting, all environmental regulations affecting agriculture under the Department of Agriculture. You know, that's just about every environmental regulation. Now, in fairness, I've just heard Representative Emmer say that to farmers. I haven't heard him say it to other audiences, so maybe he's changed his mind. I think we need to do three things to, to, to streamline the process. First of all, we need to deal with the timing. We need to make a commitment as a government that we will turn around application processes, permitting processes, in six months. We can do that for non-extraordinary circumstances and have that as an absolute guarantee. You start with an outcome and then you back up and figure out how to get it done. Secondly, we need to deal with the complexity. One of the ways we can do that is spend a little bit money up front, and it does cost some, some government money, Representative, to build out our, our IT systems so that we can have a single website where each of you can go file a single application that every agency that needs to look at it, local, county, and state, has one site that they can go to, one permit that you do, one application that, that you complete, and let everybody deal with, with that. Streamline the complexity. Some of it is from your end, some of it is from the agency end. Streamline the, the oversight. But thirdly, you know, we just need to inject some common sense into the process. I had a great meeting with, with AGC the other day, and one of the, the folks told me that he had a construction project, was, was, um, had all of the permitting approved, got to the end of the process, and as many of you understand, still hadn't locked up the, the financing in today's credit market. 
the permit expired. Nothing had changed in the project. The permit had expired just by virtue of time. He got his financing. The agency said, sorry, you have to start all over again. Ridiculous. Austin, doing a Main Street uh, water control project, flood control project, for the fill that they're using. Agency came in and said, I'm sorry, you have to certify that the fill is free of historical artifacts. And Austin said, well, wait a second, we're getting it from a certified location. You've already certified that. Still have to do it. You know, it's those kinds of common sense things that we need to change. So it's all of these issues that we need to address. Senator Dayton, what's your approach to regulatory improvement? Well, I would agree with both of my colleagues. I have a book in my library called The Death of Common Sense. And it describes some of these you know, regulatory excesses. And uh, I told the story when I was a U.S. Senator, I was told by the Mayo Clinic that there are 110,000 pages of Medicare rules and regulations. I didn't uh, take the time to read them all myself. I decided to take the Mayo's word for it. But I proposed an amendment on the Senate floor that would require the Secretary of Health and Human Services to reduce that uh, number of pages of verbiage by two-thirds within 18 months under the theory that if it can't be said in 37,000 pages, it doesn't need to be said. And uh, it was amazing, the opposition, including from the uh, AMA, because people were concerned about uh, their particular area of uh, interest uh, being changed or altered in some form. But you know, if I could wave a magic wand, I, I would eliminate the, the duplication and the triplication of reporting requirements on individuals, on small business owners, on large businesses, on charitable organizations, on local governments by state and federal governments. Uh, it, it's, it wastes thousands and millions of hours, and it doesn't accomplish the purpose of, of better uh, oversight and, and uh, public protection. And since I don't have a magic wand, I will start working on that be, beginning immediately with uh, my Lieutenant Governor running mate, Yvonne Pretner solon putting together a group of people to work on this and invite your participation in it. It'll continue uh, through the fall, and if we're successful on November 2nd, uh, right up until January 1st, and we'll have a set of proposals to bring to the legislature and ask the legislature to spend the first six weeks or two months of the next session <laughs> focusing on how can we streamline, how can we reduce the, these overlapping jurisdictions, how can we reach the goal, and it won't happen in one session, but it ought to be a goal, that there's one agency with jurisdiction, and uh, that uh, there, there's one reporting requirement, that deadlines are established, that deadlines have to be met, and if not, uh, th that oversight is forfeited. And since we don't want to forfeit the oversight, uh, uh, employees are going to understand they have to meet those deadlines. We, we, we have to provide the ability for people to make decisions and act. And I, I want better government. I don't want worse government. Multiple overlapping jurisdictions and duplicative, triplicative reporting requirements are worse government. I'm, I'm for better government. I'm prepared to roll up my sleeves if I'm governor, work with all of you and those who are affected by those uh, regulations and those uh, excessive reporting requirements. Let's identify uh, detail by detail, because government is about details, where they can be changed, where they can be eliminated. And, and I pledge to you that I'll work cooperatively with you and, and others, as I've said to other business groups and, and others who are concerned about this, to, to accomplish this, uh, over the, this over the next year, beginning of the next year and over the course of my, my first term. Candidates, I'm going to ask you to just shorten your answers a little bit. I'd like to squeeze in three more questions before our closing statements. The next question is one that we just simply cannot avoid when we're discussing public infrastructure in Minnesota, and that's what to do about the Viking Stadium issue. <laughs> it seems that it's, it's the ever-present issue in Minnesota. How are we going to provide the facilities our professional sports teams need and want, and what's government's role in providing that? Tom Horner, you're up with this touchy question. Well, not touchy at all. I mean, I think this is leadership. I think you have to put these kinds of issues on the table with specificity and, and be willing to, to take the hits if they've come. So I've laid out a very specific program. I think the Vikings are an important asset to Minnesota. We need to keep them. But I also think Minnesota has been an important asset to the NFL and to the Vikings, and we ought to ask more of the Vikings than some other communities have asked of their NFL teams. So I've asked the Vikings to pay 40% of the cost. I've asked them to sign a 40-year lease. I've said to the Vikings, you will get all of the revenue from Vikings events. The public gets all of the revenue from non-Vikings events. All of the revenue, including in-stadium advertising, concessions, suites, ticket revenue, we ought to keep all of the, the funding outside of the general fund revenue, and I've proposed streams to, to do that. Um, I think we can do it um, through a variety of mechanisms, including a, a tax on tickets, 
I think we ought to do it through Racino as a backup. Allow that, that kind of revenue source to be there to protect these important amenities. And so again, it's not just enough to say, I support the Vikings and I'm really happy Brett Favre is back and that's an answer. That's not an answer. You've got to lay it out. And it's not easy because there are a lot of people who think that, that maybe we shouldn't be doing this. Fair point. I disagree with them. I think Minnesota needs to protect these amenities. We have to be a state that has a strong economy, strong schools, strong health care system, a good infrastructure, and the amenities that make Minnesota the great state it is to live in. Okay. Senator Dayton, what about the Vikings? Well, I am happy that Brett Favre is back uh, for a starting point, but I would uh, propose that look at this project like any other economic development project. I learned when I was Commissioner of Economic Development for the state that it's a, a good project if it's in the public interest, which means that the benefits to the taxpayers of Minnesota, the people of Minnesota, through uh, and they're significant with this kind of project, some 8,000 jobs over three years, the, the, tax, uh, the taxes that those uh, employed workers would pay, the taxes that the, the vendors would pay in the construction of that project. Uh, looking at the offsetting liability if the Vikings were to leave the Metrodome of having to continue that, uh, funding that entity without uh, that revenue stream. And if those uh, uh, overall financial benefits are greater than the public cost, then it's a good project for the people of Minnesota and I would support it. And I would also roll up my sleeves as governor. I'm not going to begin those negotiations. It would be presumptuous of me until uh, after November 2nd. But if I'm elected, I'll roll up my sleeves and I'll work with all the entities, including the Vikings, uh, to work to put together a deal. As I learned from the, the real best jobs governor I've ever seen in Minnesota, Rudy Purpich, I saw someone roll up his sleeves and work to make these major jobs projects happen to benefit the people of Minnesota. And I'm, I'm hopeful, optimistic that we could work that out. Representative Emmer, what about the Vikings? Well, I, it's the one time I'm going to say I agree uh, with Senator Dayton. I am happy as well that Brett Favre is back, and I will be even happier as a kid who was born in the state in 1961 when the Vikings came uh, and grew up with the Vikings in the 60s and the 70s. I'd be even happier. In fact, it would complete the circle of life for me if the Vikings win the Super Bowl with a former Green Bay Packer guiding them. Uh, that's what I hope for this year. But you know, to suggest uh, we all try to take the high ground that, uh, oh, I've, I've presented this, I've presented that, I'm the only one who's done this. Uh, I, hopefully people will find out as we go forward. The job of the governor of the state of Minnesota is to help facilitate success for every business in the state of Minnesota, and that includes the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, people ask me, I tell them, I want a Viking stadium. I don't think you need to use general, uh, rev the uh, general fund to, uh, to support it. I think you can absolutely facilitate it. I also want 3M to expand in this state, which they haven't done in a long time. I want Marvin Windows to expand in this state. I am very upset as a Minnesota resident who uh, loves my state that Honeywell is located elsewhere. Uh, IBM has just recently uh, expanded into uh, Iowa. We want all of these jobs here because that, again, is how you have these amenities that uh, we all love so much. When it comes to the Viking Stadium, there was a proposal that was brought forward at the legislature that I don't know a lot of people heard about it, but it was a proposal where the, uh, the Wilfs had agreed to fund the, or take care of the leverage on the uh, loans, the financing for the first 10 years, and then redirect another revenue stream that currently is being used for the, uh, the convention center. Uh, in, the, uh, in Hennepin County. That's the kind of uh, arrangement that has potential. Uh, unfortunately, when it came to the legislature, apparently there were some things that hadn't been worked out between the Vikings and uh, the county. Uh, there is a way to get this done, just like there should be a way to make Minnesota business friendly, bring jobs back here, bring new employers back here, and again, you will drive not only the revenues that drive government, but you will drive uh, the revenues that will build things like a new Viking Stadium. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's change again. There's great interest in this audience, in this room, about the use of outside consultants, private consultants, to do some of the public infrastructure work that gets done in this state. Some of you, I know Senator Dayton has talked about reducing the use of private professional and technical consultants by state government. I'd like to have, invite him and the, and the rest of you as well to comment on the, the prospects for using outside consultants. If, if those outside consultants are not used, 
who will do the work and at what cost? Will that cost be greater or smaller for taxpayers and will the benefits be greater or smaller for us all? Senator Dayton, let's, why don't you describe your position to begin with? Well, the outsourcing of the use of private contracting has increased uh, very significantly under Governor Plenty and his agency heads. And, you know, I mean, th these are people who come into office with the ideology that government does everything badly and then if they're elected, they go out to prove themselves correct. And they either defund programs or they destroy them or they cut back on the ca ca professional capabilities of agencies like MINDA to do this work in-house. And uh, you know, I, I think that the, is, there's a balance to be had. And I have proposed that that be reduced and, and the, those savings be applied. And we build the, the expertise that's going to be used again and again within uh, state agencies where you have uh, public accountability and where I believe in many cases the, the costs are lower to the taxpayer. I mean, that ought to be the consideration. And uh, just as recently the uh, state of Wisconsin used the equivalent of their legislative auditor to analyze their state contracting procedures, and uh, they just gave it a mixed review that in some cases it's uh, cost effective, and in some cases it's cost excessive. And I would ask the, the legislative auditor to do the same in Minnesota, and let's look at it objectively and see where, where it's necessary, where there's expertise that resides in the private sector, and there's certainly instances of that, or where that can be provided at a better cost to the taxpayer, I will support that. And then where it's demonstrated that this is just about an ideologically driven bent against uh, public employees, and we're building that capacity in, within state government is more cost effective for the taxpayer, then I'll support that. Thank you. Representative Emmer, what about outside consultants? Well. Uh, this is the, uh, it, it's a very interesting discussion, and this is something that will uh, be a distinct difference that I think uh, hopefully the folks in this room and the people in the state of Minnesota when they go into the ballot uh, to cast their ballot on November 2nd will not only understand but will find important. Senator, I'll tell you that uh, it's got nothing to do with an ideological bent. And uh, I, I think when we get into partisanship like that, uh, it tends to take people's uh, eyes off the ball. You're talking about uh, somehow government can provide uh, a better value for the pri than the private sector. And yet we all know that someone in government right now makes, on average, 30 to 40 percent more than somebody employed in the same capacity in the private sector. That won't save money to take that in-house. We know that someone in the, pri in the public sector gets a gold-plated health care plan, while people that are similarly situated out in the private sector are lucky if they have their health care insurance today. We also know that people in government get pension plans that uh, people in the private sector could only dream of today. I mean, it's still a defined benefit plan for the most part in government instead of a defined contribution. So while everybody outside of government is watching there, if they're lucky enough to have a 401k, watch it ride the roller coaster of the market and wonder if they're going to have uh, something to retire on, it's a completely different situation So to, in government. So to suggest that by pulling this in-house, that it's going to somehow provide more value at, at lower cost to the taxpayers of the state of Minnesota is, and then to call it an ideological bent, number one, is improper partisanship, and number two, ignores actual reality that's out there. And I'll tell you, if, uh, if this is what is in our future, if we're in the governor's office uh, come 2011, if there is ever a bridge bid on in this state, it will go to the lowest bidder based on uh, the value that's being provided. It will not go when you have two Minnesota companies that are uh, not only highly reputable, but have a bid that uh, is solid. It will not go to somebody outside of the state of Minnesota. It will be built by our contractors here. Thank you. Mr. Horner, what about outside consultants? Well, I think once again, my, my two friends to the right here um, not only have the wrong answers, I think they're asking the wrong question. I mean, the question ought to be not whether we use or don't use outside contractors. Our obligation to the taxpayers, to the people of Minnesota is, what's the outcome we want to achieve? And we ought to evaluate that on three points. What is it that we're trying to achieve, specifically? How do we deliver the highest quality at the best value? And then you make a decision. And I think against those criteria, I think private consultants, outside contractors, are going to stack up very well. And it is then the role of the administration, after having led through leadership the discussion around what it is we're trying to achieve, then to hold accountable 
whoever is doing it, whether it's the outside contractor or, or government employees. And we ought to do it with absolute transparency. And I don't think there is a business in this room that wouldn't um, be willing to do this, to, to, to set up um, measures to hold whoever is doing it accountable to cost and to make it all available to taxpayers. Let's create websites that say, here's the project, here's the measure that, that we are holding this, this contractor to, here's the cost, and here's the progress they're making. Let everybody take a look at that. Hold them accountable. That's what we need to get to. But I think we also need to make sure that if we're going to, to trust the great local contractors, consultants, engineering firms, construction companies that we have in Minnesota, then we better make sure, Senator Dayton, that they exist. And while you cavalierly dismiss that only 8% of small businesses are going to pay your new high tax rate, those 8% happen to be the companies that are providing the most jobs. And I would guess most of the sub S and LLC companies in this room are part of that 8% because these are the most successful. These are the ones driving the job. And so what we ought to do is not raise their taxes through the ceiling. We ought to provide them an exemption for a part of the flow through so that they can retain some of the earnings to invest in new equipment, to invest in new jobs, to have the resources to grow jobs. That's what tax reform is all about. That's what tax reform is, Representative Emmer. It is creating jobs through good tax policy. It's what tax reform is about, Senator Dayton. It is not just raising revenue, it is creating jobs, building a stronger economy, being smart about where we need to take Minnesota in the future. Well, if we keep our answers nice and short, I can squeeze in one more question <laughs> before we go to our closing statements. And this one starts with Representative Emmer. Uh, I asserted at the beginning that in the 21st century we'll be thinking about broadband as part of our public infrastructure, or at least part of our, share, our common infrastructure, whether its actual control be public or private. But we'd like to hear your thoughts, and uh, every candidate's thoughts, about the public sector's role in securing the benefits of broadband statewide. Uh, Representative Emmer, please begin on that topic. Well, and that's, uh, I, the issue is getting government out of the way. My colleagues believe that government can solve this problem, that government can somehow step in and make investments that uh, private individuals are not willing to make or cannot make on their own. That's simply not true. And uh, we know that from the folks up at Paul Bunyan in Bemidji uh, who have shown this, uh, in a very clear way. They've extended uh, broadband coverage all the way to the uh, hinterlands of northeastern Minnesota. Uh, and they're interested in expanding it further as long as the uh, public uh, uh, elected officials don't keep getting in the way and creating new uh, regulations that they have to work within. Let them do what they do best, which is create opportunities and not only improve their own quality of life, but improve all of ours at the same time. And you can look at cities all over, uh, not the least of which Minneapolis, St. Louis Park, others that thought through, uh, again, well-meaning people that if the city got involved or if government got involved, we could somehow make this better. They have been a complete disaster, nothing short of a uh, disaster uh, with limited exception. And uh, I would also point out at the end uh, to my colleague to my left that uh, Senator Dayton is to your far right today. So. <laughs> Mr. Horner, what about broadband? Well, I think the, the residents of Monticello would be surprised that a private-public partnership is a failure. The fact of the matter is, in that community, they wanted to work with the, the, the private contractor, ran into a barrier, created a private-public partnership that now has um, provided residents of Monticello with high-speed broadband, uh, cable, and residential phone service for about the same cost that a year ago they were paying just for the residential phone service. Should we do broadband through the private sector? Absolutely. And where we have cooperation, where we have population density, where it makes sense, where there are, are investors, private investors willing to do it, of course we ought to do it. But should we say to, to a rural Minnesota, I'm sorry, you're not going to have a gateway to world-class economic development, health care, education. We're not going to be able to, to reduce the cost. I mean, Representative Emmer, this is an investment for us. This isn't the government coming in and trying to be big brother. I mean, look, at in a healthcare system in which 5% of, of people, most of those with chronic conditions, consume 50% of the cost, 
one of the most effective tools we're seeing in controlling the cost, keeping those people out of hospitals, improving the quality of their lives, is through interaction with, with uh, high-speed broadband, I mean, where they can do the diagnostics, where they can have the one-on-one -on -one engagement and see the warning signs, where they can engage with people. That's a cost-saving to us. That's the kind of investment that if you just say, let's take the status quo and see how small we can make it, we never get to. So I do think that we ought to, to look at where broadband can expand as a private investment, ideally. Some cases it is going to be a private-public partnership, and in other cases it might be a public investment. And I think our obligation is to see how close, how aggressively we can follow the recommendations of the Broadband Commission and bring Minnesota into the new economy. Senator Dayton, what about the use of government or government's role in establishing statewide broadband? Well, my staff who drove with me to all 87 counties in 87 days, over 9,000 miles, will attest to my reaction to the failure of border-to-border -border broadband access and the failure of border-to-border -border cell phone access. And if we're going to, I even see some heads nodding as I say that, because we all had that experience if you travel around this state. And, and if we want to make it possible for people to live wherever they want in Minnesota, to succeed economically, socially, we need to allow them to connect up with the world uh, as well in Warren, Minnesota, as they can in Woodbury, Minnesota. And sometimes you can't even connect in Minneapolis, Minnesota, I know from personal experience. So how we get there, I mean, I, I, think I actually would agree with most of what Mr. Horner said in this regard. I, I think it is about whatever we can do, uh, both, either or, or, both private sector, public sector, public-private public -private partnership. Let's look through whatever it is, the government uh, in terms of voting requirements and the like that are standing in the way of progress, and let's make those investments, because Mr. Horner said it very well, those are investments that are key to our future. And it's thank you. You've stayed on schedule marvelously and been through your paces. It is time for closing statements now. And miraculously, we've kept our rotation going, so let's just stay with it. And the next up would be Tom Horner. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Lori, for, for hosting us. Thanks to uh, Mark and, and Tom for being here. I think one of the, the great opportunities in, in this campaign is for us to come before different audiences, to talk to you, to share our vision for Minnesota, and to let you hear us and to hear the, the different views that, that we each have. This is an election where clearly there are three very distinct visions for Minnesota. I have a vision of Minnesota that says it's not enough just to take the status quo and shrink it as much as possible, or to take the status quo and add a lot of taxes and see how big we can make it. I think this is an election in which we need to say for a lot of Minnesotans, a lot of Minnesotans who have been playing by the rules, doing all of the right things, the status quo isn't working. We need a different approach. We need a different vision. We need the investments. We need to make sure that we do have world-class education, health care, infrastructure, and that we're willing to put our issues on the table. You know, 2011, we have a lot that has to get done. We've got a $6 billion deficit to resolve. We have schools to improve. We have infrastructure to deal with. We have a Viking stadium that has to get done before the lease expires. The only way we're going to do all of that in 2011 is that if we as candidates use 2010 to build a mandate, to put our issues on the table, to engage Minnesotans in understanding what the challenges are, what the solutions are, and where the opportunities rest. That's our obligation. I don't think the governor of Minnesota, as, as Representative Emmer suggested, is just the facilitator in chief. I think the governor of Minnesota has to be a leader. I think we have to put specific ideas out there. I think we have to be the ones who are teeing up proposals. I think the election is about leadership. Who has the vision? Who has the temperament? Who has the ability, the experience, the practical skills to forge consensus? When you look at, at 2011, we need a governor who is going to be able to bring people together, to forge a consensus. When you're in business, if you have one party over here with an unalterable perspective and another one over here with an equally unalterable uh, perspective, you don't go out and hire a mediator who has a foot in one camp or another camp. That just assures the gridlock. 
You hire somebody who is objective, who is a leader, who can understand the value of both sides, bring them together, and get Minnesota moving. Look, you know, this is an election in which we need candidates who are bold, and I need voters who are bold. I need voters who say, what we've been doing isn't working, what we are offered is more of the same. It's time to make a different approach. It's time to do something different. It's time to invest in the future, to have leadership that says, this is the kind of Minnesota that we ought to have, and here's how we get there. Thank, thank you. you very much. Closing response from Mark Dayton. I want to thank all of you for being here with us this morning, and uh, I want to thank you, Lori, for your excellent moderation here. And uh, you know, when I was commissioner of economic development for Minnesota, back when Minnesota was in the forefront in terms of employment growth, uh, economic growth, and we had progressive taxes. I would ask businesses, why are you locating or expanding in Minnesota? And the answers were almost always the same. Well-educated, hardworking, productive citizens, a good health care system, good infrastructure, a good, efficient state and local government services. Those are still the foundational ingredients of Minnesota's future economic success. And if we fail to make the investments, private sector investments first and foremost, and also public sector investments to support those, and if we fail to work in that kind of par partnership together, we sacrifice the, the future of this state, ours and our children's and our grandchildren's. So the next governor and the next legislature are going to face immediately the task of, of, of eliminating a projected $5.8 billion deficit. And that needs to be done fairly and responsibly. And then, we need to move this state ahead with working together in public-private partnerships for job creation, as some of which we've had a chance to discuss here today. We need to make the investments in education. You know, we really haven't touched on that today, but I'm sure you find with your businesses, as uh, those who spoke to me in years past said the same, that the ability to attract uh, well-educated, hard-working, productive citizens is key to business success. And if so, if we're not making the investments in education, starting with early childhood, if we're not assimilating young people from all over the world and all over the country who come here from all different backgrounds, from various learning differences and disadvantages, and, and bring them into the ability to be successful employers and employees, if we fail to make the investment in lower class sizes and five-day school weeks, which ought to be a basic in Minnesota, if we fail to make a college affordable in our state, if the tuition at the University of Minnesota is 50% higher than the at tuition at the state universities in the surrounding four states, we have the third highest uh, tuition for our pub two year public colleges, the top 10 for our public universities, so that our young people can't afford to go to college here, then we sacrifice the great strength of this state, our people, and educating our people, which is going to be key to the future. So, yes, I will increase investment in public education. And I will find the money to do so, because it's essential to reverse the funding cuts that have caused overcrowded classrooms and four days a weeks and unaffordable college, and put people in positions where they can succeed in Minnesota as your employees, as future employers, as the future leaders of our state and nation. That's absolutely essential. That's part of my, essential part of my vision for the future of Minnesota. Thank you, and a closing statement from Tom Emmer. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thank you for the AGC. Thank you to all of you. Uh, it is an honor and a privilege to be uh, running for the governor's office of the state of Minnesota and to be sitting up here at this table with these two uh, fine human beings. Uh, but there is a distinct choice that is going to be uh, made by the voters in this state on November 2nd. I, I will make it very clear that it is a choice between doing business as usual contrary to what some want to characterize uh, their position as, versus doing something different. I just sat here and listened for the last six minutes to uh, my colleagues talk about, we need to make these investments. I, well, you know what? The issue for this next election, the issue that's facing the state of Minnesota and the United States of America is job creation. It is not about more government, and it's not about the uh, constant, uh, I will make these investments. What that is, is exactly what my colleagues have said. I will raise your taxes. 
oh, we want to talk about different mixes, but it's the same business as usual model that has been here since I was a young boy in this state. Uh, and I, I will just uh, say, Senator, the, uh, when you were in the position you talk about, it was when we were celebrating in the early 70s and 80s this thing called the Minnesota miracle of the 70s. It was a tax and spend model of government. And again, well-meaning people did this. This is not about whose uh, party you represent. This is about common sense. That model of government no longer works. And there's common sense that's being applied in other parts of the country that need to be here in the state of Minnesota. Look at uh, Rhode Island in June. The state of Rhode Island with a moderate Republican as a governor and a Democrat-controlled legislature passed across the board income tax cuts, took five tax classifications, reduced them to three, took the top taxable rate, and reduced it by almost 40%. When asked why, they said because we had to stop the outflow of jobs from Rhode Island. This is not about party. This is not about the job that you want. This is about pointing forward instead of blaming and assessing blame as to how we got here. This is about where is Minnesota going to go in the future? Is it going to continue to do just another uh, rearrange the deck chairs on the, uh, on the Titanic? Or are we actually going to do the things that need to happen, start thinking out of the box, redesign government to deliver efficiently? And I, I heard earlier, I'm for good government. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm for smaller, more efficient government that delivers the services that people affect in an efficient, affordable, and sustainable manner. If we would just all get on the same page and start doing that, it's about growing jobs in our private economy, which is what you people are all about. And by the time we get to November 2nd, I think that's what Minnesota's looking for, is who's got that positive vision to start growing jobs again in the state of Minnesota, which will in turn drive what we all expect our government to deliver. Thank you so much for having us here today. Well, that's all for today's show, folks. I think they all deserve a round of applause.